Our speaker at this hour is uh, Mike Webb. Mike is a graduate of Fried Hardeman University. I taught up to 400 students a year uh, there for some 20 years on campus. And honestly, I can't remember if I afflicted Mike or not. But um, he was roommates with Will, is not that right, Mike? And I know I afflicted Will, but at any rate, um, we're glad that uh, Mike is able to speak at this hour. He received the Bachelor of Arts degree in Bible there and also the Mastery of uh, Master of Ministry. He's been in full-time uh, ministry work since that time. He has worked at the uh, Willow Avenue Congregation in Cookville and Double Springs Congregation in that same area. And presently, he is working with the Richmond Chapel Congregation in uh, the nearby area. Uh, he has um, had uh, some good years, you know, in local work. And presently, in addition to the work that he's doing at Richmond Chapel, he is working with Southeast. He's been recruiting um, work, been doing recruiting work for about six years. And he is presently also the Dean of Admissions and teaches some Old Testament courses. Mike uh, loves the Word. He loves to teach. He loves to preach. And he has a great love, you know, for uh, the um, work of the Lord's Church uh, in general. And so we're happy today to have him as a speaker. And I want you to give your kind attention to Brother Mike Webb. Mike. I can say I was afflicted by Brother or Dr. Leip, um, but I enjoyed his classes very much, and I uh, was blessed by his teaching, and just as our students are, are blessed by his teaching now, and I've uh, been very blessed by his commentary uh, that uh, he wrote on John, and been blessed by this study, as I know you have. So thankful for the opportunity to speak today. Thankful for the opportunity to speak about uh, this encounter that Jesus had with this Samaritan woman. When I first received this assignment, my first thought was, this is easy, either uh, the easiest assignment or the hardest assignment. I don't know which one uh, it is because um, I am been given an assignment that most people are very familiar with. But then how do I talk about this with preachers who have preached on this and taught on this and, and offer anything uh, that would be new and helpful? Uh, but the more uh, I know you've had this experience, uh, whenever you really take the time to study the Bible, you always mine out things, always find things that are helpful and beneficial. And as I was looking at this, the Gospel of John is special and unique. We've been talking about it uh, this week. It, is, it was written, it was given to us to create faith, to help people to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, to, to help people to know who He is and to have a, a believing faith that would give us eternal life. And so as I was looking at this particular conversation, see, John isn't like the other Gospels in that it's uh, written to give us a, maybe a chronology of Jesus' life. We don't have the, the parables uh, the way the other Gospels. He, he has a specific goal in mind. He has miracles that are carefully chosen to create faith. Uh, the I am statements to help us to understand who Jesus is. But also we have these these private conversations that Jesus has with individuals. And we have, uh, we're blessed with, with two right here at the beginning. The first, of course, was Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus in chapter 3, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 21, is a, is a teacher of the law. He's morally upright. He's someone who should have known who Jesus was. He is a, he's a man and he's an educated man, a morally upright man. But here in chapter 4, we find a woman, an uneducated, uh, morally corrupt, ostracized woman. 
We find a man who goes to Jesus uh, wanting to have a conversation with him. In, in chapter 4, we find a woman who is uh, just going to, to get a drink, <laughs> going to a well to draw water, who has no, you know, no foreknowledge of this, has no intention whatsoever of meeting Jesus, has no interest whatsoever in talking with him. Uh, but we have conversations with both of these people. And we have the fact that Jesus takes the time to talk to them. And we learn some great things from both of these conversations. We have been given a task. And as I was studying this, we've been given a task to take the gospel to as many people as possible. To the whole world. We've been given instructions by God and we've been given a monumental task to make disciples of all people, right? And to teach as many people as possible about Jesus and make them disciples and help them get to heaven. How do we do that? Well, I think we can learn a great deal from the conversations that Jesus has with people in the Gospel of John. Specifically from the conversation that Jesus has with this woman, uh, this woman of Samaria, as he goes and talks with her by this well. Our focus will be on how the master teacher goes into a hostile land, finds the most unlikely prospect causes her to see her need for salvation, and then makes her a missionary. Have you ever thought about what happens here? That's exactly the, pro, uh, the, the progress of this conversation, isn't it? He, he goes into a hostile land, finds a very unlikely prospect, helps her see her need for salvation when she didn't really see that need, and makes her a missionary. He does all this... After he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. John 1, verse 11, I think is one of the most, one of the saddest, most discouraging verses in all of the Bible. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. You know, John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But he came to his own. What's he talking about there? He came to his people, the Jews, the ones who had been uh, told throughout the whole Old Testament. I, I get a, an opportunity here at Southeast to teach Old Testament. And those Old Testament classes are, are full of uh, Jesus as he's, you know, explaining to his disciples. He goes to Moses and the prophets and it reveals all the things they, that they say about him and <coughs> telling that he was to come. They're full of, of prophecy that he would be coming and that he would save them from their sins. But they, they just ignored all of that. They didn't receive him. We're going to see in this particular chapter, starting with this woman, what, what happens when he goes to the Samaritans. A completely different response. We, we read in John chapter 4, verse 1, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although he himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. Now, this is an interesting phrase. He had to pass through Samaria. Jesus didn't have to pass through Samaria. He, most Jews would go around. They would go from Jerusalem to Jericho, and they would go over the Jordan River there, and they would go through Perea and go all the way around Samaria. They would kind of go along the, the coast there and cross back over the Jordan River up around Galilee, right around the Sea of Galilee. Now, they would take that longer route. Why? Most of us who are familiar with this know they would do that because of the intense hatred they had for Samaritans. They just despised them because of the fact that they had been, um, when the, this is a kind of a long involved story, I guess, but most of you, uh, if you, if you're not familiar with this, the kingdom divided after Solomon, the 10 northern tribes, they began to worship idols. And because of that wickedness and idolatry, because they refused to repent after all the prophets that God sent them, they went into captivity. And uh, 
the Assyrians took them off into slavery and they brought other people in and, and those pagans mixed with the Jews that were there and those people were, were not full Jews. There, there was a mixture of things there. They, they continued on in that uh, mixed religion and they worshipped in the wrong place at the wrong time in the wrong way and the Jews in Jerusalem, they, they just they looked down upon them. And so there was a, a hatred of these people. And now most of the Jews would come from Galilee to Jerusalem. Uh, Josephus lets us know that, that some of them would go through, uh, holding their nose probably the whole way, not talking to anyone or looking at anyone because of prejudice. They would go through there, but most of the time they would go around. But Jesus... Morally, He had a mandate. Jesus would say in John 4, 34, My food is to do the will of my Father who sent me. He needed to go through there. I must go through Samaria because he had a mission. Why did Jesus come to this earth? What's he say in Luke? The Son of Man has come to do what? Do seek and to save the lost. Jesus had a purpose. He had a mission. He knew what he was going to do. And so he went through there and he took his disciples through there. It says that he came to the town of Samaria called Sychar near the field of Jacob that had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus wearied as he was from the journey. He was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. This is about noon. Natural time for tired travelers to rest, to take some refreshment. This particular uh, territory was, was rough. It wasn't easy traveling as they would go through here. Uh, the Greek here is the perfect act of participle, um, perfect tense, emphasizes a state of weariness. He was worn out, just worn to the point of exhaustion. He, he needed to rest. And so John's gospel emphasizes both the deity of Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. But it also emphasizes his humanity. He was tired. You ever get tired? It's Tuesday of the lectureship. I'm already a little bit tired. How about you? You know, we get a little tired, don't we? we get a little worn out. But he's tired. He wants to sit down. He wants to rest. Uh, its focus here is the, the disciples go into town to get something to eat. He's sitting here uh, needing some refreshment from the travel. He was worn out. And it's here that he has the opportunity. And he takes the opportunity to meet this woman. It provides him an opportunity to talk with her, to have a conversation with her, and to change her life. One of the things that we see in verses 4 through 7 is that Jesus takes opportunities. And he meets people where they are. Read with me verses 4 through 7 here. Um, I'm sorry, verses, uh, this is actually, yeah. The woman from Samaria came to draw water. He said, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The woman came to draw water. He was thirsty. He asked her for a drink. Um, the, the woman came to the well to draw water. It was a gathering place. Now, Jesus takes a, a, a moment here. It takes an opportunity because he's tired and he's sitting here by this well. Jesus, um, having this need that he had, takes an opportunity he could have kept going, but he sits down by a well, knowing this is a place where people would gather. A lot of times, what do we do when it comes to talking to people and meeting people? What do we do? We build nice buildings. There's nothing wrong with a nice building. It's nice. It's comfortable in here, isn't it? The, the seats are comfortable. The air is comfortable. Um, it's a good gathering place. It's a good place to, uh, to be. Uh, we have a nice sound system. We're able to... Uh, to stream this videos out. I mean, it's uh, the buildings are nice, but Jesus didn't go and, and, and build a building when he came to earth and wait for people to come to him. What did he do? He would go out 
and he would find where people were. And there he would wait for opportunities to talk to folks. We need to think about that when it comes to the way that we do evangelism. He went to where people would gather. The woman was at the well at noon alone. D.A. Carson, his commentary, tells us that women would normally gather uh, to get water in the morning and in the evening when it was cooler. This particular woman, it seems from the context, uh, as David pointed out in his lesson last night, context is king. Uh, words imply and we infer. Uh, we'll see more from the things that she says about her life. She probably would come at this time because of her lifestyle, because maybe she, didn't, she wasn't welcome with the other women or didn't feel welcome with the other women. She comes at noon alone to draw the water. Her lifestyle probably made her somewhat of an outcast with others. But it allowed Jesus to take some time to identify with her and talk with her, to begin a conversation with her. Verses 7 through 9, the woman from Samaria came to draw water, and he said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink for me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now this is interesting. Uh, we have some parentheses here. This is uh, some commentary that John gives us. The Bible's its best interpreter. Always is. It tells us that, that the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, if we did not know that already, if you didn't know the culture and the, and the background. But even more so, this, just the fact that she was a woman would be enough for her to be surprised that you're talking to, you're talking to me. <laughs> you're talking to me. Because men didn't talk to women. Men wouldn't even talk to their wives in public. You're a Jew and you're talking to me? Jews didn't talk to Samaritans because Jews didn't have dealings with Samaritans. They wouldn't have anything to do with them. You want a drink for me? Jesus didn't have anything to draw with. The only thing that was there was her water pot. I was talking to my friend Benny earlier. He was, would Jesus really drink from her water pot? This woman, this Samaritan woman, would he really do that? You know, the, the Mishnah says this, it, became, it would become law that all the daughters of Samaritans are menstruants from their cradle would be in a perpetual state of ceremonial uncleanness so he asked for a drink of water by doing this. He proves that gender, race, religion would not keep him from doing the work that the Father sent him to do. He broke down all the barriers. Jesus had a care about souls. His purpose was to come and to seek the saved, the lost. Not to seek and save Jews, not to seek and save men, and not to seek and save just certain groups or people. He came to seek and save all lost souls. He didn't come just for one person or one kind of people. He came for everyone. And in this second conversation, he shows that clearly. He does it in a very subtle way. Just, will you give me a drink? She is completely shocked and surprised and, and doesn't know what to do or what to say. How, how, you're talking to me? You, you want a drink from me? How, how is it that you're even talking to me? A, a Samaritan woman. He, would, he, never, he never sinned, not one time. He never broke one of God's laws. But he would set aside the teachings and customs of men so that a soul could come to know the truth. And we must do the same. 
In verse 10, he, took, he takes control of the conversation. He, he says this, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus changed the direction of the conversation. She's just shocked and surprised he's even talking to her. Then he's asking for a drink from her and he starts talking about something else. He changes the conversation from physical things to spiritual things. As we're talking to people and having conversations with people, it's tricky and it's not always easy, but this is something that we must do. Um, Jesus identified with her need in verses 7 through 9 and he changes the conversation. She needed salvation. That's something that we need to do. And we need to be able to learn how to change the conversation to spiritual things. Uh, when you're talking with people, we learn from the master teacher here, change the conversation to spiritual things. Um, we need to learn this from Jesus. He talks about the gift of God and about his true identity. He, he's, he's trying to help her see who he really is. She doesn't know who she's talking to, and, and she doesn't really understand what she needs. Most people that we talk to, folks, they don't understand what they need. They really don't understand what their true needs are. And this is something, we, we wonder sometimes why, I, I try to talk to my friends about the Bible and about God, and they're just not interested. Well, probably because they don't really understand what they need. They don't understand what their needs are. You're the same way. If you don't understand you need something, are you interested in it? No. Um, until you know that you need it, you don't want it. That's why, you know, salesmen have to work so hard. When you walk into a store and somebody comes right up to you and they start trying to talk to you, what do you do? Just look and, you know, leave me alone. You know, don't bother me. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need your help. We don't want to talk to people if we don't feel like we need their help. Now, if you need something, you, you look for... They're always there when you don't want them, and you can't find them at all when you need them. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> you can't find a, a salesperson with a flashlight when you need one, can you? Well, this is the situation here. She doesn't know that she needs any help until he helps her to, to discover it. He's offering her living water. If she only realized that she had come, he had come to give her eternal life, she would have asked him for this living water. He intentionally uses a phrase, though, that um, was open to different interpretations. He does the same thing um, with the temple in chapter 2, verse 19. He does the same thing with born again uh, with Nicodemus in chapter 3. Um, He's talking about a spiritual thing, but it's open to a different interpretation. He's trying to help people get to where they need to be without just telling them head on. He wants them to, to arrive there on their own. She didn't know Jesus' identity yet. She didn't realize she was the one in need. And so he, he talks to this. She misunderstands. It takes her a minute uh, to, to grasp what he's talking about. The woman said, Sir... You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where did you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Uh, yes. Uh, she doesn't understand that yet. He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give to you will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give to him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said, Sir, give me this water that I may not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Go call your husband to come here. The woman said to him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. He wants to help her see her spiritual need. Now the connection here between him saying, go get your husband in this conversation about the living water, at first seems 
very odd. It almost, the first time, the first several times I read this, it almost seemed cruel that Jesus said, go get your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. He said, you're right, you don't have a husband. And I always thought, why? I don't understand. Why did Jesus do that? It almost seems mean. But there's something more to this. And I appreciate Brother uh, Dr. Lipe so much. He really helped me understand this in his commentary. I, I really didn't for a long time. I, I thought I... Because sometimes when you first read something, it just doesn't seem to click. It doesn't really make sense, you know. Uh, this is the point. She needed to see... She had to see her need. And when we look at this, she, she kept making daily trips to the well. She had to make daily trips to the well because she needed water. She had a thirst for water. But see, she, she did not feel this need for God. She didn't feel, she didn't have that thirst spiritually. She didn't see the condition her life was in. And so many people are walking around and their lives are broken and their lives are, have been destroyed by sin. And they know something's wrong, but they don't know why. They have no, they have no way to connect those two things. And they have no idea they can fix it. They have no idea there's a remedy for that. And so when Jesus says, go get your husband, she had to understand, there's so, she had to make a connection, there's something wrong in my life. And so that's the way he connects this. It may seem brutal and abrupt to change the conversation, but he knows for this woman to focus on her moral and spiritual needs, the conversation needs to get personal. It had to get personal. Her thirst for the living water could not be awakened until she understood her need for the water of life. She, need, she needed something to help her confront her spiritual need, her condition. So he says, go call your husband. He wanted her to admit the mess that she had made of her life, to, to see, you know, I don't have a husband. You're right, you don't have, you've had five, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. And so that was, then she begins to, to, to get a grasp of what's going on. Then she says, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. When we start to get into some of those personal things and people start to perceive that we know them, sometimes they want to change the subject. I know I do. You start to touch on some things like that. Sometimes, okay, let's, it's time to, let's get off of this and onto something else. Um, she tried to change the subject to things that the Samaritans and Jews disagreed about. She tries to do it twice. And she says, okay, um, let's change the subject here. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say we should worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem you'll worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is a spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. Jesus never backed away from the truth. He always, always told the truth and spoke the truth. And He speaks the truth to her here. The woman said to Him, I, I know the Messiah is coming. He was called the Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I speak to who speak to you. And he. This is the first time in the Gospel of John that Jesus very clearly, um, very boldly says who he is. He tells her, I, I, I'm the Christ. I'm the Christ. I am the Messiah that, that you've been looking for. And after all the things that he's done, the miracles he's performed, 
talking to Nicodemus, a teacher of the law. You're a teacher of the law and you don't understand these things. You don't, you don't see. You must be a teacher from God because no one can do the things you do unless he's sent from God. He didn't get it. Look at how she responds. Look at how she responds. When she hears these words, he says, I, I, I'm he. Just then the disciples come back and they marvel that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? The woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come and see a man who has told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Why did she come at noon in the heat of the day to that well? She came to draw water. What did she leave behind? She left her water pot. What is she doing now? Her one job. You had one job. What was that one job? To go get water. And what did she leave behind? She leaves her water pot. What is she doing? I just met a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the cross? She's a missionary, folks. She had forgotten the one thing that she went to do, and now she's telling everybody about Jesus. She went into town and starts telling folks about the Christ. Has anyone that we've read about so far done that? Has anyone taken the message so far? No one that we've read about so far in the Gospel of John has. She becomes. A, she goes and she tells them. Could this be the Christ? They went out of town and were coming to him. Now, she's created a movement. The people from town have left what they were doing and they're coming to see Jesus. Have we seen anything like this so far? Nothing. The Jews have not done anything like this so far. It's amazing. What's our message for today? First of all, we should follow the Samaritan woman's example in evangelism. She hears, she doesn't even hear that much from what we have recorded, but what she hears, she shares. What, the, 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 what she knows, she tells. As far as the scripture we see in scripture, Nicodemus never openly declares himself to be a disciple of Jesus or brought anyone to Christ. We don't have a record of it anyway, that he openly declares himself a follower of Jesus or that he brought anyone to Christ. Not that we know about, but this woman brought an entire village to Jesus the first time she met him. We can follow Nicodemus' example or we can follow Christ's, uh, or the, the Samaritan woman's example of what they do with Christ. We can be like... Uh, Jesus and get our nourishment from doing God's will. In verse 34, we read, um, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So his disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to them, My food. See, another one of those spiritual conversations. Uh, that they take very literally and don't understand. Now, we went all the way to town and bought this food. Now, wh wh he's not eating. What's going on? Who brought him food? No, I'm not talking about physical food. My food is to do the will of, my, of him who sent me and accomplish his work. Do you not say that there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look. I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields they are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Now, this is a true statement. It is a principle Principles are always true wherever you put them. But I also think that when he's saying this, that there may very well be 
a, a illustration involved as well. As he's saying this, it's very likely because of the context that you know they're looking at a field and it's not time for the harvest yet. But as he's saying this, he's saying, look, because there are people walking. Where, what, what is happening? The Samaritan woman just went to town and told the people, I think I may have met the Christ. And a lot of folks are coming to see Jesus. But we're going to read about that in here in the next couple of verses. So it's very likely that he's saying, you look and see there's no, you know, he's talking spiritually. My, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. It's very likely that as he's saying this, there's this whole group of people who were walking towards him. And you're saying that there's still four months to the harvest. We'll see, look, the, 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 the fields are ripe with harvest. You're entering into the labors of someone else. One of the things we can learn for, from this, a message for us today, is that we must keep our eyes open for opportunities that others have made. I have entered into many labors that other people have prepared for me in my life and in my work. Other people have planted and, and, and worked and I, I've, I've entered into that, that labor on the back end and, and, and been able to benefit from their labor. The fields were ripe for harvest when I got there. I feel like even at Southeast, I, I'm definitely uh, just uh, entering into the labors of many other people and what, they've, what the work that they've done. Look at what's happening here. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Sometimes we'll be the one who sows. Sometimes we'll be the one who waters. Sometimes we'll be the one who reaps. But we need to keep our eyes open for those opportunities and not miss them. Many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He says, for here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sit you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. She became a missionary and many believed because of that. He has told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritan came to him, they asked him to stay with them. He stayed there for two days and many more believed because of his word. He stayed there and taught them. They entered into the labor that she had prepared. We must be ready to, to reap from the work of others. She was just a woman, a sinful Samaritan woman. However, she, unlike any disciple of Jesus so far, was able to bring an entire town to Jesus. The Jews had many more advantages. They rejected him at every turn. The Samaritans believed. And, and now th look at what is said here. Look at what they say whenever they hear his words. It's no longer because of what you said we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. May everyone that we know, everyone that we come in contact with, be able to say that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. I hope that you believe that, and I hope that you will continue to share the message so that everyone can say before it's everlastingly too late that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Thank you so much for your attention.